In my vlog on Shropshire folklore of Mary Webb, uh, I mentioned that it, Mary was heavily influenced by Charlotte Byrne. And a jointly authored book, Shropshire Folklore, A Sheaf of Gleanings. I actually find that A Sheaf of Gleanings is ready available, both from booksellers and online. So I've decided to begin a series based of, um, uh, from the large and detailed book. Uh, where I can, I'll augment it with additional materials. I think I also need to apologise that it'll mostly use still photography that I can find on the internet. As from Indonesia, I often cannot find, well, I cannot find relevant video clips and I'm most unlikely to return to the UK again. Charlotte Sophie Byrne, or Lottie, 1850 to 1823. Charlotte was actually born just over the border in Staffordshire at Morton Vicarage. Um, it's said that she inherited her interest in folklore from her mother, also called Charlotte Byrne, but this time Charlotte Annan Byrne, 1820 to 1893. Uh, Charlotte's father, Sambrook Thomas Higgins Byrne, 1822 to 1861, was born into a wealthy Staffordshire family. Uh, he matriculated at St. Trinity, uh, sorry, at Trinity College, Oxford, in 1841, but did not take a degree. Uh, but it would seem that he was disinherited by his father. He was assisted by his brother, the Reverend Thomas Byrne, um, whom was the perpetual curate of Morton in Staffordshire. However, the family to move to Summerhill, Edgemond in Shropshire in 1854, having exhausted their welcome at the Morton Vicarage. And Lottie seems to make a big point of this, that she's um, finally living in Shropshire. But the truth is, <coughs> all of these spaces I speak of are just running along the border of Shropshire and Staffordshire. They're very similar places, to be honest. Now, her father's said to have taken to shoot in hunting and drinking. In 1857, he was tried twice thrown from his horse and as events surrounding it were somewhat taboo it's fair to assume that he was drunk but this led to his premature death in 1861. Uh, Lottie suffered uh, a serious illness during her early years. Uh, conditions of ill health and obesity would impede her physical well-being throughout her life. In 1875 Byrne became friendly with Georgina Frederick Jackson, who was collecting material for a, Shof a Shropshire workbook, 1780, uh, sorry, 1879, and its companion book, work with a provisional title of Folklore Gleanings. And Jackson's demise led Byrne to take over her material, adding her, her own collection of tales to produce Shropshire folklore, a sheaf of gleanings. Uh, this probably explains the claim that the book was jointly authored. In the 19, uh, 1890s, she resided at Pyburch, Eccleshall, again in Staffordshire, uh, where she collaborated with the local folk folklorist and folk song collector, Miss Alice Annie Keary of Stoke-on-Trent. Together, they spent three years, uh, around 1890 to 93. Uh, collecting material locally in North Staffordshire. Uh, while a number of joint papers were published, Byrne moved to Cheltenham somewhere around 1894, and the project failed to reali be realised in a book form. Uh, she became the first female president of the Folklore Society, 1909 to 1911, and, and indeed was active in the Folklore Society for some 40 years. Any visitor to Shropshire will be impressed by the majesty of the Reekin. At 1,335 feet, it's actually smaller than the brown clee to the south. Uh, but lying on a plain, it seems particularly impressive. 
My father insisted that many American airmen during world stationed at Atcham during World War Two flew straight into the reeking, being unused to such a structure. The earliest mention of the reeking occurs in 855, as entered in the late uh, the late 11th century Worcester cartillary named uh, Recosentum. Its modern form is believed to have come from modern English by way of Mercia, and it's likely to have taken from the early Celtic Rikon. There's an ancient hill fort on the summit, almost eight hectares inside, called Uriconi. It's thought that the fort was built by the Celtic, Celtic Corvoni tribe, and was once maybe their capital. In 47 CE, Roman soldiers stormed the fort and set fire to it, moving the defeated tribe onto Roxeter or Viraconium, Corvonium. However, despite the Corvoli eventually setting Roxeter, settling in Roxeter, there's only limited evidence that the Romans stormed the hill when they arrived in the area. All around the Rekin, right round the Rekin, or running round the Rekin, is a phrase common in Shropshire, Worcestershire, Staffordshire, Herefordshire, the Black Country, and Birmingham, to mean the long way round. Although as a child growing up in Shropshire, it was always used for someone who took a long time to get to the point. To all our friends around the Rekin is a toast traditionally used in Shropshire, especially at Christmas and New Year. Uh, some believe it can be found in Houseman's, a Shropshire lad, uh, but what he actually wrote was, On Wanlock Edge, the wood's in trouble. His forest fleece, the reeking heaves, the gale it plies its saplings double, and thick on seven snow the leaves. Charles Dickens visited the uh, visit to the reeking provided the basis for an entire article entitled Roman Turnips, published in the May edition of All, All the Year Round. Uh, Dickens may have alluded to one of the more intriguing, lesser-known customs associated with the reeking, when he wrote, seen from from its top, spreading of the dawn on summer mornings. The sun dance was an ancient Christian practice that traditionally took place on Easter Day. Uh, It exists throughout um, the British Isles, and generally involves trapezing to the top of a local, local hill, in order to view through a variety of mediums, the celestial body, the shimmering, as it were, jars of water, sheets of darkened glass and primitive sunglasses, were all used for this purpose. Uh, the phenomenon, a consequence of light reflected in s- refractions in certain atmospheric conditions, was gar- regarded as a seasonal indicator of the weather. If the sun's reflection moved slowly, a dry summer would ensure, whereas if it rippled, water would remain plentiful. Uh, The inclement weather in the area can be said to be predicted by the visibility of the reekin. The saying being that if you can see the reekin, it's going to to rain, and if you can't see see the reekin, it's already raining. An identical saying that I've heard in Burnley referring to Pendle Hill. Another well-known local legend is that you cannot be a true Salopian unless you have passed through the Needle's Eye, a split between two rocks close to the summit, or that lovers who scramble through the gap together, thus threading the needle, would later enjoy a trouble-free marriage. An alternative being that a girl will never marry unless she has passed through it. Uh, this is perhaps rather unfortunate, as the reeking was the site for some of the child abuse in the Telford grooming scandal. Uh, the giant Gwenvol reeking ap shenkin ap min mawa. I don't know if I've got any any Welsh speaking listeners here, but should that not mutate to min vawa? Anyway. I don't think it's actually in Welsh, I think it's Britonic, so that could be the reason. But anyway, the giant was called Grenvol Reekin Apshenkin Minth Mauer. For some reason had a grudge against the mayor of Shrewsbury and its people. Now some say he was Welsh, but as I say, the name could simply be Britonic. 
but certainly with the Anglo-Saxon conquest of Shrewsbury from the Celts, there's a long-standing animosity between the Welsh and Shrewsbury. Now, it's said that he decided to dam the River Severn to flood the town. So he set off carrying a spade full of earth and walks trying to find the way to Shrewsbury. On his way from Wales, he became tired and lost, and close to Wellington, he fell exhausted, where he met a cobbler who lived in Wellington and went once a fortnight to Shrewsbury to collect his customers' old boots and shoes and take them home with him to mend. Now, I have to say this story is a bit odd because Shrewsbury had been a centre of shoe and boot making, uh, as evidenced by the shoemaker's arbour in the dingle. But anyway, <laughs> I'm spoiling the story, aren't I? Gwenval explained his mission to the cobbler and asked to be taken to Shrewsbury. But fearing a loss of his living, the cobbler refused. And the giant put down his load there, and there stands the reeking hill to this day. Even the earth he scraped off his boots became little arkle to the side of the reeking. Alternative versions simply claimed that the, gi- that claimed that the giant intended to bury Shrewsbury under the earth, or that Shrewsbury residents with old boots and stale uh, uh, it was the Shrewsbury residents with old boots and stale bread intended to deceive their enemies. Uh, whilst another that he, he was not a giant but a, but the devil and upset at the sight of Roxeter, um, Roxeter Church Tower. Similar stories of churches over Shropshire uh, follow in this vlog. Tales of giants creating hills can be found in many places in the UK uh, including in nearby Bewdley in Worcestershire. Now, of course, back in the time of giants, Shropshire was absolutely full of them. You see, I guess there's so many hills where they can sleep under. And on the banks of the River Oney between Church Stretton and Ludlow is Stokesay Castle, a 14th century fortified mansion. The origin of this stoke, or, or dairy farm as stoke means, goes back to the conquest, where the manor was a part of the holding of the Lacey family. Uh, by 1115, it had been regranted to Theodore de Say of Sai in Normandy, or Stoke Lacey became Stoke Say. Uh, but the main construction was undertaken by Lawrence of Ludlow, although he was based in, in Shrewsbury, the richest wool, wool merchant of his generation, who acquired Stoke Say in 1281. Uh, during King Charles I's reign, um, it came under the ownership of the Craven family and was used as a supply base for the king's forces in the area, uh, based in strength at nearby Ludlow Castle in the early stages of the Civil War. A skirmish took place at the castle during the English Civil War, in which Stokesay was handed over to the parliamentarians after a short sleep siege without a pitched battle, um, and it's a good job because he would almost certainly have been severely damaged had the be. On either side of it rise fine, bold hills cutting into the valley. The easternmost of these is crowned by large entrenchments of Norton Camp. On the southwest, called Yeo or View Edge, has an earthworks on its summit. Both camps were to guard the Coman Road, a Roman Road, which once ran along the bottom of the valley. The area around Stokesay belonged to two giants who lived. Uh, the one upon View Edge and the other at Norton Camp. They were probably brothers, for the land belonged to them both, and so did the money. They kept their money locked in a big oak casket in the Volks under Stokesay Castle, and when either of them wanted any, they just took the key and got uh, and got some out, and then took the key back to, back with him. Uh, but alas, one day, one of them wanted the key, and the other had got it, so he shouted out for him to throw it over. But he made a mistake and threw too short, and dropped the key into the moat of the castle. They tried to find it, but were unable to, and there it lies now, at the bottom of the moat. Many have searched for this treasure, but it's never been found. 
Uh, the chest of the treasure still stands in the vaults and nobody can get into it. And there's said to be a great big raven always sitting on top of it, protecting it. Another local legend suggests that uh, the foul fiend combining some of the attributes of the, the, the wild huntsman. Um, also associated with wild Edric, um, whom, I've, whom I've issued a separate vlog on with those of the laborious giants. Uh, the giant's graves are mound on the shop side of the Lanamanach Hill or uh, Beth al -Kawa. A giant buried his wife there with a golden circlet around her neck and there's been many vain attempts uh, to try and find it. Despite a story of three brothers who overturned the capstone and were visited with sudden death immediately afterwards. Uh, but the hilltop itself is a prehistoric hill fort to the east of Offa's Dyke and the Bretonic Bethal Cower appears to, to support the theory that the Cromlech is a burying place. Uh, there's a giant's well in Hawkston Park, although there's many legends about Hawkston Park that I will probably cover in a future vlog. Funeral garlands, sometimes on display in Shropshire churches, were also believed to be the work of giants. The devil's chair on the Stiper Stones is said to have been created after the devil dropped stones from his leather apron. I've just realised that's quite interesting because you know these trendy leather aprons that people wear in shop, well, in cafes and, and fancy shops now. Well, they were actually invented by a lady from Shropshire, or the modern versions were anyway. Anyway, in one version he was carrying them to the Reekin, others say he was carrying them to Ireland, but yet another says that he was simply going to fill the Hell's Gutter on either side of the Stiper Stones. Uh, the leather apron is said to have broken, spilling the stones. Feeling tired, the devil then rested on his chair. Uh, there is a tradition that the devil hates England the most, that if ever the Stiper Stones sink into the earth, England will be ruined. The, the, the devil therefore goes whenever he can and sits on the chair at the top of the hill in the hopes that his weight will flatten it down and thrust it back into the earth. On the longest night of the year, the devil sits on his chair and summons all his local followers, witches and evil spirits, and they choose their king for the, for the year. Unfortunately, the back of the chair is no longer fully intact, Although the weather can often change dramatically on the Stiper Stones, still giving the feature a, a very eerie quality. A similar story was told about the Giant's Chair on the Clee Hills in South Shropshire. On the adjoinment, adjoining Longmind, there is the Devil's Mouth on the road between Church Stretton and Rattling Hope, or Ratchup as I call it, mentioned in my vlog on Mary Webb. Uh, whilst on the re Reekin, there is the Devil's Dingle. On the road between Acton, Burnell and Cardington is a stretch of pavement, two or three hundred yards in length, known as the Devil's Causeway. It once formed part of the Roman road leading from Roxeter to Eshbury. I wonder if that should be Rushbury. I'm sure it should, Rushbury. The Devil is said to have laid, laid it in a single night and he haunts the scene. If you cross the causeway at midnight, you will meet him in the shape of a black man with cow's horns and hoofs riding on a white horse. And any poor character will be confronted by the devil, will set, will set upon him and struggle with him and leave him half dead. The pavement is said to contain a satanic frog well. Its waters, according to, to locals, are always cold. It is believed that a beautiful fountain, fit only for the fair, fairest of water nymphs, the frog prince, the devil and his imps, appear in the form of frogs. Three frogs are always seen together. These are imps, the largest frog being the devil himself, remains at the bottom and shows himself seldomly.
When Warfield St Peter's Church near Bridge North was built, the site originally chosen for it was on top of a neighbouring hill. But the devil would not allow it to remain there. As if it were placed in such a conspicuous spot, the spire, a rare site in Shropshire where towers were more usual, would attract too much attention and draw too many worshippers to the church. Every night he pulled down all that the workmen had built during the day and carried the stones down to the place where the current church now stands. Indeed, eventually the men got so tired of such fruitless labour they began to build in the spot where the stones are collected. The devil didn't molest them any longer and they worked on the low ground and the church was safely completed. Uh, this appears to be linked to the story of St. Peter's Well in Warfield. In the low marshy hollow between Wem and Shrewsbury, there are the ruins of Broughton Church. This too was first placed on high ground, but every night the work of the builders was mysteriously destroyed. Uh, the people decided that it must be work of the of devil, and thus they began work in the valley below, and they were no longer interfered with. Uh, the first site chosen for Bass Church, Church was on top of Birth Hill, a smooth grassy mound outside the village crowned with the entrenchments of a British camp. It is approached by an ancient causeway leading through the meadows beside, uh, beside a, a, deep, uh, a deep dark sheet of water known as Birth Pool. Uh, but as long as the building was carried on at the Birth Hill, it was always pulled down during the night. The stones thrown into Birth Pool until at last the disheartened people tried a fresh, fresh sight, and then their work was allowed to remain. The same story is told of Stoke on Turn Old Church. There, the stones which were taken to the top of the hill above the village in readiness for the building but every night were carried down to the swampy ground beside the grip river where the church now stands. Again, similar stories do exist all around the UK. Thank <laughs> you.